star Aim for the moon If your man shall hit a star Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to Better Together. We're gonna be sharing our lupus stories and supporting one another through our journey. And tonight, fellow loopies, we're on an extraordinary journey with some amazing people. Emmett Henderson, many of us know him by his Instagram handle, at Male Lupus Warriors. And we have Tiffany Peterson, uh, founder and CEO of Lupus Chat, also known as Tiffany and Lupus. And we have Chanel. We have another Chanel coming up. I'm so excited for this show. Um, and if these names are new to you, you are in for a treat, 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 because they are all some amazing and lupus warriors who do a lot of advocacy and really are people that you can connect to and are part of your lupus family. By the way, I am Chanel Gabriel. I'm the host of Better Together, sharing our lupus stories. And I'm here with our medical expert, our medical host, Dr. Michaela Bayard. We like to call her Dr. Michaela. All right. Our topic this evening is our caregivers, finding caregivers through the holidays. And we know caregivers can be family. They can be the boo, your baby, yeah, your family members, your, uh, some of your friends. Um, and for some of us, like myself, we play this role ourselves. So during the holidays, we know depression is often at an all-time high. Everyone is stressed out trying to figure things out and also dealing with so many things and the traffic and the shopping. Um, these are the times where having a caregiver can really, really help ease our stress. So bringing in Dr. Michaela, um, Emmett Henderson's story of caregiving is both a love story and a health emergency. So we're gonna, um, I'm, Dr. Michaela, where are you at? Bringing you in to the conversation. Hi, Chanel, so great to see you tonight. I am so excited about our topic for caregivers and our guests, who you yes. know some of. Um, but I just wanna say we're excited. Um, our topic is caregivers. And I wanted to get a little bit into talking about Emmett and some of the personal medical journey he's going to share with us because he's being so vulnerable and opening up our story, his story, so we can learn from it. And a lot of it uh, hinges on something really big happening in his life and that he's trying to get a kidney transplant, you know, and this can be something that we think about with systemic lupus erythematous or lupus. So we have already talked a lot about how living with lupus can mean so many different things for each individual. I'm sure you can attest to that, Chanel, just from the different people you've met through your work. But we wanna talk a little bit about what it means uh, and why you might be looking for a kidney transplant if you have lupus. And as I mentioned, lupus can affect so many people differently, but one thing that we can see and one possible symptom is kidney involvement. And you may know this, but the kidneys are responsible for a lot. Um, they clear waste in our body. They help clear excess fluid. They're really responsible for breaking down medications and getting rid of toxins. So you can just imagine how important having your kidneys fully functioning really is. So when we think about lupus and kidney involvement, we're thinking about inflammation and how it can decrease the kidney function. Mm -hmm. And so when someone has changes in their kidney function, that's really impacting their day-to-day -day life. And, you know, Emmett might share with us some of that today. Um, we do at a later stage decide that someone may need a new kidney. And, you know, I am jumping over a lot of that process because it really takes a lot both on the medical end and the personal end to get to that decision point. And there's a lot of treatments and medications that happen before that because we're always trying to optimize someone with the kidneys that they have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if it does get to that point um, and someone is looking for a kidney, there it could be a waiting process. And so we're speaking a lot of positive energy into Emmett's process. We're excited for him and hoping that that is going to be part of his process in the near future. But, you know, we just wanted to share with you some of the things we think about and why as rheumatologists, we go crazy testing your urine and your kidney function because we are really just trying to make sure they're functioning at their best. 
So peeing in that cup is very important, y'all. <laughs> yes, that's why we're always asking for your urine when you come to see us. <laughs> no, and that's definitely important. I think um, just I think that that's one of the things that people are nervous about. I know Nick Cannon has kidney involvement. He mm -hmm. has lupus nephritis, which is um, just that other type of you know activity in lupus um, inside of your kidney. So. Uh, I'm so excited to speak to Emmett and to learn more and also to recognize that lupus is a man with lupus. <laughs> and I think sometimes we don't always think about that. We only think about it affecting so women. And so I'm very excited to have him and his caregiver to be able to uh, speak to us about what it is to be a, a caregiver uh, to each other in that way. But I am also excited to talk to our next guest. They're coming later, but our guest that we're going to talk to right now is uh, has a similar story to myself. They, they, they really did a great job in learning how to navigate and find support on their own. Um, and I, I know my first poem that I, I ever shared my lupus was about was called Vanity. And it really talked about what it means to be a caregiver to yourself. And right. uh, Tiffany Marie Peterson is, is that and is, is a rock star in that realm. And Tiffany Marie Peterson is a writer, lupus advocate, and creator of Lupus Chat. So we have, um, they, you know, Lupus Chat is a, a resource that I'm very excited for her to share and speak to. Um, but her mission is to educate and empower lupus warriors and their caregivers to be more proactive in a healthcare environment mm -hmm. and in an environment that honestly is still learning how to care for us. Yeah. Stay. And I can't emphasize enough, Chanel, how important Lupus Chat is because um, I send so many of the patients I work with to use those resources. So we're just so excited to hear from her. So perfect. And uh, Tiffany and Lupus is the handle. So you got to make sure you follow her. But we're bringing Tiffany Marie Peterson to the stage, to the virtual stage. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, it's so good to see you, Chanel. Oh, so good to see you. Sorry. Tiffany was one of the first people I connected with when I was diagnosed in quite some time when I first started looking for resources. And um, I, I feel like it's important to start kind of with that resource because it, it started out as a hashtag, right? How did, did it? Yeah. And, and what are the, the patient and caregiver goals that you see lupus chat working to accomplish? Well, um, the goal for lupus chat is to really give resources, education, support, and empowerment for both patients and caregivers. Um, to be able to do those day-to-day -day things that sort of improve the patient's care and overall quality of life, um, as well as to provide those same things for caregivers. Um, it's It can be really difficult for caregivers to prioritize their own wellness when they're also caring for another person. So we really strive to help caregivers learn how to communicate effectively and how to sort of just recognize those signs and symptoms for, for those that they care when they're not doing well. Yeah, and, and in your story, I want, I'm curious, like, I know that this was important, but what led to you even starting this? Were you always aware of the lack of resources? Did you, was it come, did it come out of frustration? Just curious about that. It did come out of a place of frustration, also a place of rage. Um, <laughs> when I was first diagnosed, you know, I didn't know anyone with lupus. Um, and at the time, you know, that experience that I know so many others can feel is like you get into your doctor's office, you know, you get this huge diagnosis and that's really all you can focus on. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, I wasn't really given any sort of additional resources besides being told I was, I had lupus and, you know, it would be a forever disease and here are some medications, you know, to treat it and you have to take these all the time and I'll see you in three months. And I was just like blown away. I was like, I don't even know like where to turn, who to go to, to let me know what life with lupus is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really frustrated by that. So I went online and I was just trying to find um, anyone else who had lupus, just so I can like talk to someone who was in the similar position to I was. Um, and I didn't find a lot of, you know, educational resources online. I didn't see a lot of community support. I did find some blogs, um, but, you know, the, a lot of people were sharing those negatives. Um, and that wasn't something that I really wanted to focus on. And that really mm -hmm. was encouraging for me during my early diagnosis days. 
So I kind of felt like, you know, if this is not something that's currently out there, you know, I kind of want to strive to be that for, for someone else. Because I remember how isolated I felt when I was first diagnosed. And I was like, it was such a horrible feeling. I never want anyone to, to go through that the same way that mm -hmm. I did. So I strive to create Lupus Chat, which is, you know, an online uh, community in which we have conversations. We have discussions about how lupus can affect the body, different organs, and just like how to manage it with day-to-day -day life. Um, mm -hmm. Our conversations happen on Twitter every other Sunday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we've been really blessed to have like rheumatologists, nephrologists join our discussions um, and really provide, you know, accurate resources and support and education around mm -hmm. lupus. Because I feel like the internet can be full of so much misinformation and we're striving mm -hmm. to like be able to provide a resource for others. Yeah, Dr. Google gives a lot of things out there. So having a credible source and having credible sources and people also living with it, you know, I think that that's so important. Um, I don't know, Dr. Mikael, you have a question? I just want to bring you in. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's so important to hear about how that diagnosis impacted you. And I hate to hear that story because I would be enraged as well. But I, I also want to know for, from a health professional perspective, like not only when, but how can we offer you resources? Because, you know, we want to do it in a way where it's going to be something you're looking to and sinking in. And I think sometimes we'll say, and by the way, you know, check this out, but you're already, you know, getting so much information. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Tiffany, like, what do you think healthcare professionals can do to better serve us? Um, okay, so that's like a loaded question. Like, you know, bring it, bring it in. Um, really what I want to focus on how health professionals can sort of serve our communities better. Um, I think I would like for them to focus on cultural competency mm -hmm. and to really start addressing how racial bias in the way that medicine is currently being practiced and the role that they may often play in being complicit. Um, I think that healthcare professionals should strive to create initiatives and partner with organizations that support underserved communities um, and really ensuring that they provide equitable care. Because I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the hospital um, with issues of chronic pain and not receiving pain medication, you know, which we know is due to the color of my skin. Whereas if another patient had came in, they would easily have access to those medications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are statistics and facts that show, you know, that Black women are not being believed in the medical setting and that can sort of lead to really severe consequences. So I would really love for healthcare for professionals to really focus on that and see what they can do personally to make sure they're making a shift in how medicine is being practiced. It's true, Tiffany. Unfortunately, some of those are real stats. And, you know, I work in medical education and that is where I try and focus on understanding how we look at patients and think about patients and try and work on our biases. But just for the patient perspective or someone in lupus chat, like what tools do you give them? Um, I would say that we like to just provide a place of health literacy. I think that's the most important thing. So many of us don't know exactly how lupus affects the body. Lupus can affect anything, especially if you're diagnosed with systemic lupus. Um, so I really think that providing that information for patients is really important. We want them to know the signs and the symptoms of if lupus is attacking their dental health or whether their kidneys are being affected. Um, the importance of making sure that they're doing routine care, they're getting their lab work, done routinely so that way their doctor can know how best to work with them to create a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. Like those are the things that we really want to communicate to those, especially those who are newly diagnosed. And sometimes for those of us who are more seasoned with um, managing lupus, we can still need those reminders. No, that's that's really helpful. And that's, I didn't even think about lupus and dental. You know, like even, even those kind of things, I don't think we always think about the connections between that, sometimes the medication we're on and, and the way that it can impact all of these things. So, yeah, thank you for the resources you're giving people. I, I know 
personally that you've educated me on a lot of different things during a lupus chat um, conversation on Twitter. But um, we're also talking about the holidays and the holidays are a stressful time. But um, why do you think we should be more guard? Do you think we should be more guarded around the holidays? What do we need to do to protect our energy? See my holiday uh, nails. <laughs> 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 what do you think we need to be doing for ourselves, us loopies, uh, during these kind of seasons? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the winter season is when, you know, usually when sickness is in the air. Um, and it's also a season where people are gathering with their friends and families, um, especially for us as individuals who are immunocompromised. I think it's really important for us to make sure we wear a face mask whenever we're traveling outdoors, whenever we're indoors around others, you know, we're immunocompromised. We have to make sure that we take those steps to make sure that we're protected. I know that, you know, um, the CDC or other, other organizations are not really pushing to be wearing your mask, but I feel like it's extremely important. Um, I have not experienced COVID in the years that it has been present and I wow. severely mask at all times. Um, it's very difficult and it's very challenging, but I think that's probably the most important, as well as making sure that we're up to date on our vaccines. Um, I think those are important takeaways as we hit flu season, Tiffany. Thank you. Can't even say we hit it. We're in it. I feel like everybody <laughs> around me has some kind of bug somewhere, you know, so <laughs> I think we all messed up. Some, some of us didn't wear that mask um, <laughs> and hand sanitizer is not as readily accessible as it once was. So definitely wanting to take care of us. Oh my goodness. Well, I know that we have questions in the chat. Everybody out there, just so you know, please make sure you're putting us uh, your questions in the chat. We're going to make sure we have time for that at the end to address those. So keep, keep commenting and make sure you're engaging with each other. This is about us sharing and connecting um, on the platform that you are on. Um, and uh, so we're going to actually go bringing in our no another guest, our, our duo, uh, of guests, actually. Um, we talked a little about them before. And um, I do have another question for you, Tiffany, but I'm going to save it to the end. <laughs> but I think Emmett really has something important to say. So we have Emmett and Chanel, another Chanel, aka she's also known as G.I. Jane. And they are our, our second set of guests, and they're each other's caregiver. Both of them are our folk that do speak a lot about lupus advocacy and working in that work. But and it's better known as males with lupus, living with lupus. So please welcome to our virtual stage, Emmett and Chanel, aka G.I. Shane. Hey, everybody. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? So glad to have you both um, sharing here. And so I really want to know, you have to tell me, I love a good love story. Okay. I'm a cancer. I'm very sappy. I love it. Please tell us how um, Emmett or Chanel, either of you, tell us how you met each other and, and Chanel, how, how did Chanel end up becoming your caregiver? Um, we met actually through a group, a lupus group. And, um, Emmett had made a post about men with mental health and how important it was for men to be able to speak up about mental health. And um, I have a son who has mental health disease. So my comment was, you know, thank you very much for, for being brave enough to bring this awareness to men. It's important for other men to see that they're not alone. And uh, then he slid in my DMs, as they say. <laughs> right, that's how you do it. Yes. And we just struck up a conversation. It was definitely nothing about dating. It was, you know, do you have lupus? And yes, I do. What type do you have? What have you been through? So we just started talking about, you know, the different things we'd, we'd gone through with our own lupus journeys. I'm about 10 years behind him. Um, but yeah, you know, we were able to identify and there was a lot of things that we had in common, you know, just experiences that we had went through in relationships and, mm -hmm. and just life in general with our children. And so then we met in, per in person and uh, we've been stuck ever since. <laughs> well, that, that part about the DMs is her version. So we'll, we'll but that'll be for another story. Oh, you, you were just asking for a medical advice. That's, a, that's really what it was, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I mean, like, hey, you have a suggestion for a rheumatologist? <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful story for both of you to be able to have um, have the same illness and be have, going through the same battle together. So technically, you're both each other's caregiver, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, though, you know, it, it worked out really well because I, at the time that we had met, I was going through so much in regards to projects I was doing for my organization. And she was right there to help me with everything. Um, I took an advocacy trip to Africa. She was there for me the whole time, supporting me through that. Then when I got home, I got sick. And we kind of put all the work to the side. And she was able to kind of be there for me during that time. So that kind of just grew our relationship stronger and, uh, and, and, and better for everything. She understood, you know, with me having lupus that I don't have to be that macho man every mm -hmm. single hour of the day to where I have an illness that sometimes takes that away. But I think the biggest thing is that she sees me fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. And so she knows that I'm not a quitter. I don't give up. I keep going. And, you know, I see that from her as well. So that's where we click. That's where we click. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. And and Chanel, I know you, you said you're a few years behind him on in your diagnosis. Um, can you share a little bit about your lupus story as well? Yeah, I was initially, I was in an accident in 2008, December of 2008 um, in the military. And it was a severe mm -hmm. accident. I had a vehicle roll over me. And um, I have a lot of hardware that was put in my spine and all of a sudden I wasn't healing and I wasn't mm. healing like the doctor said I should be healing. But I, I mean, I was fighting um, two years after my accident. I was back to doing a PT test. I was an honor guard soldier. And so it was very important to be active, but I, I kept getting sick. I kept being in pain and was confused. And then in 2011, I got a phone call from my doctor asking me why I had, I had not made an appointment to go over my lupus diagnosis. And I was like, my what? Wow. <laughs> and so that's how I learned what lupus was. And that was in 2011. And ever since then, um, it's been a fast journey, but it's also been a long journey. Um, but I had a wonderful, wonderful um, doctor and I had a wonderful pain management specialist that she sent me to. I am a rare uh, patient. I'm allergic to pain medication. It actually causes anaphylactic shock. So I had to figure out how to balance life, what I was eating, emotional um, aspects of my life to keep my flares down and so forth. <clears throat> I have to ask, because you guys are mentioning so much, how do you balance all of that? Well, the thing is, is that because we understand each other, it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say easy, but it makes it more easier as of opposed to not understanding what we go through and accepting those challenges. It's like, it's okay that we both have a day off. I mean, look at our shirts. We both have, <laughs> it's okay to not be okay. So mm -hmm. when she's not okay, it's easy for me to accept it and vice versa. So, mm -hmm. you know, with projects that we have together that I'm doing separately, she's doing separately, you know, we help each other out. Um, but at the same time, we, we just keep the, the main word intact. And that's just trying to inspire because no matter what we go through, we can show everybody that we can get through this and be on top to do everything that we're supposed to do to not let this illness define us. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It sounds like, you know, you guys are partners in every way more than just, you know, caregivers for each other, but, but it's still a sounds, big role. It's communication. I think, you know, cause sometimes we don't communicate effectively or what I've said, he misunderstands and vice versa, you know, just natural things, but communication is the biggest. Um, I, and I think for any relationship, whether it's a friendship, family, you know, if you have a caregiver, you need to have a solid communication with them. And one important thing is also to admit that sometimes you're not okay. I mean, as men, and I know I can speak for a lot of fellas out there, you know, we always want to give the persona that we are okay all the time, when technically sometimes we're not. But yet a lot of us don't know how to really express that to our partners. So I, I try to be as most transparent as I can. And yeah, there's still that part of me that says I'm okay when technically I can probably use some help, but that's the guy mm. in me, the ego in me, that I still work on every single day. <laughs> that's that's a process, a process. It, it definitely is, it definitely is. 
And I mean, um, you mentioned something, I do want to bring it into the space, just uh, the idea of being a man living with lupus. Um, I, I would be amiss if I didn't give you space to talk about why is that, that's your, it's literally your ha your, your name on Instagram. And why was that yeah. important? So when I created Male Lupus Warriors, I wanted the word male to stick out there to the 90% of women that have lupus. I want to let them know that everything I talk about is from a male's experience. I got diagnosed with lupus, nephritis, and SLE in 1995. So back then, I didn't have support from another man on how to deal with an illness. If something is beating me up, how do I stand above it? I didn't have that type of support back then, even in the early 2000s. I didn't have any of that. So in most cases that I've known from men, we don't talk about it and did not talk about it. Mm. Now that lupus took me out of my career and I had all this time in the world now being on disability, I decided to try to give back to the community what wasn't there for me. And that's being that voice for men, being that voice for anybody that is confused on what this disease is doing to us. What is lupus? Do men have lupus as well? What is the difference? So me being transparent and being open about all my experiences from transplants, surgeries, you know, organ failures, it's just letting people know, well, wow, men do get lupus and this guy's not afraid to tell it all. So with the community feedback that I'm getting from everything that I'm doing, the acknowledgements, it's like, I wish that was there for me, but I'm just proud now to be that voice today. Hmm. It's amazing that you're that voice. And, you know, I think that it's so important that people get answers about lupus from someone who has it. So we really want you to share some of your story and take us through a little bit, because I know you have been diagnosed for a long time and your journey has gone through lots of ups and downs. It has. And the most notable is what we talked about earlier is what I'm currently going through now. I'm going through my second kidney failure and I just got put on dialysis. So I've been doing five manual treatment dialysis a day. That is very consuming, very, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes a lot out of me, uh, strength wise, adds a lot of fatigue. But again, with Chanel here to help me through it, it, it makes it easy for me. It, it doesn't allow me to give up because I don't think she'll let me. I, I got to hear from her. So I'd rather <laughs> not hear from her and, and just keep going and do what I can. And then not to mention all the support that I get from the community. But mm -hmm. I had a kidney failure when I got diagnosed in 95. It lasted me up to 2012 when my kidneys completely stopped. And I did about 14 months of peritoneal dialysis. Got a new kidney and I was strong for the next 10 years up until two months ago when I went into kidney failure again. So mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm looking to get into my second kidney transplant, and that's to add on to a previous transplant, which was a bone marrow, uh, bone marrow stem cell transplant to slow the aggression down on my lupus, which was a clinical trial. And it did. I got to be thankful for that. So me going through a third transplant to me, you know, with God by my side, my family support, I I'll get through it. But this is one of the biggest challenges that I have right now, because 10 years ago, I was a lot younger, stronger, you know, and able to take it this time with COVID as well. It, it, it took a little toll on me, but hey, I'm here. I'm doing it every day. So I thank God for that. I mean, we, we can see your strength and we know you're going to get that kidney transplant. Yes. Um, but I, you know, just wanted to tell people a little bit about dialysis. Maybe you can share because I don't I don't think everyone really knows what that is and how involved it is. You kind of just say, oh, and I went to dialysis and I'm back. But it, it's a big deal. It is. And I was told that. But I think what it is, is that the attitude that I'm putting out about it and it's not for everybody because, again, this is my second round. So I kind of know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And I was strong then, but I think facing it now, I feel a lot stronger towards facing it now. It's amazing. And so for people who don't know, when you go for dialysis sessions and there's different types that uh, Emmett mentioned, you're um, basically hooked up through IVs and there's a machine that does what your kidneys would normally do that I was talking about, which is, you know, clearing and cleaning your blood and um, helping make sure that your kidneys can still function optimally, even if the function is down. No, definitely. I think that that's really important to also share because I, I I do think that sometimes we do talk about things and it sounds like something that, oh, I just go and do this and but really being prepared. And I think having 
having support around you, um, you know, just helps with that, with the, the, the things that are unknown or maybe it might be a really scary to some, being able to have support is helpful. And thank you so much for being a resource um, to men living with lupus as well as to others. Cause you know, we do, we do see, uh, of course, living with lupus is challenging all around, but recognizing that particular demographic there, it's really important. And I'm going to put this into the universe. We're going to speak this into existence. Your kidney is on the way. Okay. Yes. Um, Yes. That it is. Yes. I actually just had a friend of mine, no, no, shout out to her. She just got a kidney donated by an old high school friend. Yeah. Um, and so just, you know, I know that it's possible. I know that there are stories. And to those out there that's watching, like, oh my goodness, maybe I have kidney issues. Always remember one, all of our lupus looks different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also know that we have people like Emmett, people like Tiffany that are just people like myself that we're in Chanel that are just fighting. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you all sharing that. So I have another question. Um, now I think that there's something to be said and Tiffany kind of came on talking a little bit about what it means to taking care being take care of yourself. We know caregivers and having family support is helpful, but um, what do you do to take care of yourselves individually? I'm just curious, like what does self-care look like for you? I'm gonna start with that. Sure. I think um, one of the things for me is having lupus as well. I know that I have to really, really fight for self-care because if I don't, then I make myself susceptible to flares and other issues. So one of the things that I do, I, music, music is one of my greatest releases, um, you know, cooking, being around family, um, sometimes laying in bed, just laying in bed with my headphones on, <laughs> just laying in bed. Um, but that is one of the biggest things is, is, and also finding peace, you know, making sure that everything is at peace. You know, my, my home is my peace. And so. Um, I try to leave work at work, you know, home at home and make sure that home is peaceful. So That's right. That's right. Yes. Home is peaceful. Let me see. I'm going to throw this. I'm going to throw it to the other box. Tiffany, um, just curious. <laughs> how do you let self-care for you? Um, self-care for me is sometimes a challenge. I feel like, you know, we especially when you're, you have a chronic illness like lupus, it can be so difficult. You get down and down in the dumps sometimes with what you're going through, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're experiencing like chronic pain and whatnot. But I try to remind myself that I don't need to do anything to deserve rest. Um, mm -hmm. And I need to make sure that I give myself permission to just be where I am in that moment, like really assess how my body is feeling at the start of every day. Like, okay, mentally, how am I doing? Um, physically, how am I doing? And just making sure I take those steps to make sure I pour back into myself because it can be so overwhelming, especially for those of us who um, really advocate for others and, you know, we're out there providing support and community support for our patients and their families, but we need to make sure that we're also pouring back into ourselves. So mm -hmm. I really try to just check in with myself at the beginning of each day to see what I need. If I need to take a couple of more hours in bed, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, make sure I get that rest. You know, I really try to just listen to my body. That's, that's my biggest thing is listening to my body and doing what I need to do to get through the day. So mm. Tiffany, who's that person for you? You know, you are giving so much and also trying to check in for yourself. Who who plays that role for you? Um, I would have to say I, ha I live with my two best friends um, and they've just been phenomenal in being there for me whenever I'm in need. Um, they know that if it's been a couple of hours and they haven't seen me that like, OK, Tiffany's having a rough day, like they check in with me. Do you need do you need me to make you something? So I know you need to take your medication. So like, let's order DoorDash. I'll make sure you eat so that way you can take your meds. Like they're just really there all the time. And my online community also is always there for me. Um, my Lupus Chat colleagues as well. Um, shout out to Elizabeth, Christelle, 
<laughs> and Carlene. Um, they are remarkable women. I don't go a single day without tuning in and connecting with them. And they really give me the strength to go on. That's amazing. I um, appreciate you sharing. You know, it's so good to hear from also people in support positions. And I want to ask Chanel too, you know, share us a little bit about your story. I know you play this big role as caregiver, but what is your lupus story? Um, well, in 2011, I um, started, it started with having a pituitary tumor. And um, I was having severe headaches. Um, I was having black fluid from my breast, things like that. It was, it was really um, unusual. And then they kept telling me that it was just women issues. It was women issues. And then all of a sudden um, I had to get some cysts removed from my uterus and I had um, endometriosis so bad that it had spread to my appendix. And later on that day, my appendix burst. And I had to have two surgeries with less than 24 hours. So that really, like, I, I just wasn't recuperating. Um, they would try to give me a lot of pain medication uh, due to the fact that I had so many injuries. My jaw was broken and wired shut. Um, all my ribs were broken. Both my collarbones were broken. I had pneumothorax mm -hmm. in my left lung. I have half a left lung now. Um, I had to have three vertebrae were crushed, so I have a metal rods and a metal cage holding up my spine. Mm -hmm. had surgery on in my left knee and my left foot. And more recently, a year ago, December 7th, um, on my right foot, where they were going to do a, amputate, a partial amputation, but they wound up doing a reconstruction instead. Um, I've lost my, uh, I had to have a full hysterectomy due to lupus. I've lost my gallbladder due to lupus. Um, for me, it's, I also have rheumatoid arthritis, so I suffer with a lot of this aching. Um, living in San Diego is really a lot better climate for me. Right now with the rain, not so much. <laughs> yeah, that rain. <laughs> it's kryptonite for me. <laughs> it puts me down immediately. Um, but I, I've just been blessed that um, I was taught how to keep a journal of my symptoms, pay attention to when my body's telling me hey, you're about to flare, and then just trying to be proactive in that, especially with dealing with Emmett, because he's been so sick. Um, it's almost like we're in competition. <laughs> Who, who's going to get sick the worst today? <laughs> going to have the most fatigue today. <laughs> since my kidney failure, should I say, since kidney failure. Oh, yeah, because before the kidney failure, he was definitely out doing me. <laughs> he was definitely out doing wow. me. Um, but yeah, he, he could out walk me and everything. Oh, yeah. But now, you know, it is what he, he's doing phenomenal though. He's doing phenomenal. That's beautiful. And thank you for sharing your story. You know, we happen to know that you have done a lot of work in education in psychology. I think that's your degree. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about from your, you know, psychology perspective, um, how you can think about mental stress and, you know, emotional stress for both patients and caregivers. Well, I don't know how many people are familiar with this term, but it's called neuropsychiatric lupus. And what that is, is that it describes feelings of depression, headaches, mm. um, lupus fog that we all go through. I think the statistics are like 87% of lupus patients deal with that. And so watching my loved one deal with lupus, um, some days he's irritable, you know, some days he's kind of moody. <laughs> he's like, wait, um, what? Hey, hold on. <laughs> but I know that that's a day, um, that's, that's a moment that, again, probably because of training, that I, I have to listen to what he's saying. I have to listen to what his frustration is. Is it really a frustration with me or is it a frustration with what lupus is doing to his body right now? Hmm. Because there's a saying, you know, hurt people hurt people. And, and Emmett by no means is violent. He is not a violent man. So let me put that disclaimer out there. <laughs> he's a teddy what, bear. <laughs> emotional hurt, you know, yeah. emotionally when you're hurting, you can be snappy. 
you know, with your loved one and, and, and you didn't mean to, but you're just in pain. You're just like, Oh my God, I just want them to leave me alone. And you know, you have those moments. And so knowing that has helped me know when to just kind of be quiet, when to back off, when to just give them a moment to, you know, just, just, get a self back feeling together. Usually has to take some medication <laughs> and then he'll, we'll talk. <laughs> I'll bring some food. <laughs> Disclaimer again, that's her version. So. I was about to say, I was like, hold on. I feel like Emmett has some thoughts. I'm reading your face. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> but like, even as supporting in supporting Chanel, just curious, like for you, um, you know, how's that process been for you? It's new. Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't say that it's new because I use my own experience of how I dealt with things. And, you know, I put myself, <laughs> was I like that before? And if I was, okay, I know how to handle this and deal with it. And I, and I think she nailed it when she said that. Is it because of what she's going through to make her be a little bit irritable herself? Or is it something that I'm doing wrong? But either way, I tried to look at it and see, of course, as a man in any relationship, health or not, you know, we should step back a little bit and see what is causing this and, and try to fix it again. It doesn't matter whether you're healthy, sick or going through, but it does. Health does come in play when you're hurting all the time. You already have that stress on your mind that your body's going through through things. You're easily aggravated, easily being irritated. So sometimes just, you know, taking it like a champ and, and being the bigger person is just what you got to do sometimes. No, and I definitely know for me, like, there are times I just don't want to be bothered with people. <laughs> there are times where it's, for me, yeah. it's like, I'm just achy. I'm miserable. Actually, no, I, I don't want any lovely platitudes about how I'm going to get better. Right now, I just want to go on my bed. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah. And, and sometimes that's necessary. I think that to what Tiffany was sharing before, like this idea of like, it's okay to not be okay. Like your shirt. Yeah. And like, I think yeah. that that was something that everyone yeah. said here, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, I, I kind of need you to leave me alone <laughs> and not Pretty take much. that personal <laughs> and not feel like that. Sometimes we do need those quiet spaces to really, uh, you know, to really help us, you know, regather our strength as we move forward. And not only gather your strength, but gather your thoughts, yeah. replay the situation back in your head and be mindful about the outcome of what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm so good at talking myself through arguments on my own, like in the <laughs> by myself in the room. Oh, he has to have the last word. <laughs> it's so true, though. I'm so happy you guys all shared that because I think that, again, you guys are have dealt with this for a long time. So it's easier for you to get to that point of really creating boundaries but for a lot of my newer diagnosed patients, that idea of restructuring your work-life balance and your day-to-day -day is really, is really, really tough. And it, it, yeah. it probably is taking you all some time to get there. Oh, yeah. For me personally, um, it took five years to really get back into the civilian world working and mentally and emotionally handling it, especially with the lupus, not letting it affect me to where it affects my health. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's something that a lot of people aren't aware of, you know, how much it takes out of you. And, and, and Tiffany, um, I know you had a few things that might have related to this in an article you wrote um, some time ago for a fight like a girl. I know that there, I feel like you said that there's some things that might have changed in that, but I, I think that those things that I remember reading were really helpful. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to give you the floor um, for your messages to, to folk living with lupus and what fighting like a girl looked like. Absolutely. I mean, I think that possibly the first step is just to acknowledge what you're going through. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, when it comes to dealing with being diagnosed with a chronic illness, um, we go through that period of denial where we're just like, is this, is this really happening to me? Is this what I'm experiencing? Um, I definitely went through that. I felt like, you know, in the beginning I was just angry and then I don't know about anyone else, but I definitely went through a period of time where I was like, do I even need these medications? I don't think I need this medication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really had to just acknowledge to myself and realize that I have this, but it's not the end of the world. Like there are steps that I can take. There's community support out there. Um, being on top of 
taking my medication every day, um, it's really important. Just acknowledge it. Um, I think that's pretty much like the most important thing. And then also to just find your family or find your people, um, whether that's in person or online, you know, sometimes it's your friends and your family who's there for you. But if you don't have that as a resource, know that there are people online and different support groups that can be that person for you and you can support each other to get through with whatever it is that you're going through. Um, and I would say another step is to educate yourself. Um, learn the symptoms because, you know, if I had known the symptoms of lupus, then perhaps maybe I would have had an earlier diagnosis and I wouldn't have gone through such a severe mm -hmm. um, circumstances. It's definitely important to make sure we educate ourselves on how lupus can affect us. There are so many different aspects, as we spoke earlier, mentally. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, lupus affects our mental health um, in such a major way. And it's really important for us to make sure that we're having resources to help us get through that. Um, becoming an educated patient is just really a great thing. Um, and then I think after that, like sharing your story is, is important, you know, mm -hmm. um, by us sharing our stories, we're able to connect with others who are like, okay, that looks exactly like what I've been going through. And maybe I can do this, maybe I can get through this. So I really think it's important for us to make sure that we should continue to share our stories and continue to share our experiences with each other. Um, because we never know who we can touch and who can respond to those things. No, thank you. And that, that was so such great points. Thank you for outlining them that way. I definitely know for me um, in speaking to a, a, a and I recently just um, connected with somebody was that was newly diagnosed. And that was one of the things, uh, quite a few of those things are are the touch points that I shared with them, just being able to to communicate and share what's going on and learn more um, from 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 good resources, not necessarily just Google, because right. there's so much out there. And I think um, both of you, um, both, I'm looking at both squares on the screen, but um, you all are uh, just definitely folk that do a lot of advocacy and are really great resources for others. So I do encourage all of you out there, make sure you follow everybody um, and find everybody on social media. But we have a chat that is ready to go. There are the questions in the chat. If you have not um, shared a question in the chat, now is the time. We're going to open it up to our awesome, awesome uh, chat to, to curate this conversation around it. We have a lot of love. Elizabeth caring for lupus is like, Tiffany, uh, quite a few people are, are fans of yours <laughs> in the chat. And, and, hell, and we have a lot of folk from all over the country that are joining that are joining in with us. So um, I'll say that there is uh, one question that I saw that was asking, you know, what are, uh, I guess they're asking Tiffany, when you were first diagnosed, um, what was that process like? What was that? We didn't quite get that story and backstory from you on your lupus journey um, to your diagnosis. And I don't think we got into Emmett's as well. Um, well, I was diagnosed in February of 2010, um, and I would say that at the time, you know, I didn't connect the symptoms that I was experiencing, um, but, you know, now that I'm more knowledgeable about the signs and symptoms of lupus, I really realized that I was having symptoms as young as like 16, 17, 18 years old in high school. Um, I would I would have so many joint pain in like my wrists and my ankles and my knees. And my doctor at the time didn't really acknowledge it. He was, he told me, um, you know, 18 year olds don't get arthritis and, you know, stop looking for attention. And I was just like, okay, well, since my doctor's not taking it seriously, then I'm not gonna take it seriously. And I just kind of like put it in the back of my mind and just, you know, took some leave if I, if I got a pain or two. Um, and it wasn't until several years later when I was in college where my symptoms started to get more severe. I was experiencing hair loss, my joint pain began to get really excruciating. Um, and then there was one day when I woke up and I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I couldn't move without excruciating pain. And I was unable to walk for like about six to eight weeks. Um, I had to really depend on my family to just be there for me. Um, and um, when I was able to see a doctor and have blood work done, they were telling me like, oh, maybe you have rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, we'll send you to a specialist. And that's when I learned that, you know, 
I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, I actually have lupus. Um, but it would have been amazing, you know, to know the signs and symptoms back then. And maybe it, I wouldn't have experienced such a severe, you know, circumstance. Mm, and, and Emmett, I'm just curious about your, how you, um, how you came to a diagnosis. I know that was something that we don't always talk about. Oh yeah. It was very similar to Tiffany. Um, being, you know, in 1995, I was a young manager in my company, you know, and as a young black man, I, I, you know, had a lot to prove uh, in the industry I was in. So I started feeling pains in my joints, very bad. But like a guy, we don't go to get checked out because something hurts. Mm -hmm. I literally got to be bleeding to death or broken in order <laughs> to go to the hospital. So pains did not deter me of leaving my company to go to get checked. But then I did go finally because of how bad my wrist was at one time, where I thought I broke it. But then when I went to the emergency care, they did x-rays and they couldn't find anything wrong. In that whole time I was there for x-rays, my wrist started to get better. So I'm thinking, okay, no big deal. Let's go out of here and, and keep going. Not even a week or so later, same thing with my knees. Just like Tiffany waking up one day, barely can move. I fall to the ground trying to get up because I had nothing in my knees to support me. So I go to the emergency room again. By the time I get there, I'm able to walk. And it's like, what happened? I was just not able to get on my knees or, or able to stand because of my knees. And now I'm here, I'm walking, let's do x-rays anyway. They did mm -hmm. x-rays, nothing was wrong. So now I'm embarrassed because they keep telling me nothing's wrong. I don't go back to about another year and a half, but in that time, joint pain from my elbows, my knees, my ankles, my wrists was still there. Mm -hmm. And finally, I had pains in my lower back. And I'm like, okay, the lower back doesn't have a joint. It's not my spine, so I'm going to go get checked out again because I was barely even walking straight. When I went in, they finally drew blood. They didn't keep in mind, they didn't have to draw blood because of joint pains, the pains I was having. But when they did this time, they noticed that everything was off in my blood counts. So that day I left, the, I left my job to go to urgent care. I didn't go back to work till a year and a half later because they finally saw something was wrong with my blood. They kept me in there for three months of doing testing, finally got diagnosed with SLE. That lower pain I was in my back was my kidneys. So that's when I got diagnosed with nephritis as well. That's where my journey started. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Somebody actually asked us, and I'm gonna direct this to Dr. Michaela. What are some of the symptoms? It sounds like we have a few that people can maybe pick from, but what are the symptoms for lupus? I feel like I remember hearing that there are 12 specific indicators or markers, but I could be wrong by now. No, not at all. I mean, so, you know, we have the textbook way we, we diagnose lupus, and then we have all the other symptoms that people experience. So, you know, when we're thinking of the classic symptoms of joint pain, as you've heard, kidney dysfunction, um, even anemia or blood, uh, blood cell count changes, um, skin involvement, like rash. Some of you may have heard of the butterfly rash, but there's lots of different rashes that you can see with lupus involvement. So when we think about lupus, we actually think about all the different systems it can involve. And um, there's many different symptoms and it's so different from person to person. But um, I think what Emmett was saying is when you're not feeling like something's right and you know you keep showing up and you're not getting answers, that's really when you need to push your uh, healthcare providers to really understand what else is going on. And I think it's why all the people in this room feel so strongly about lupus awareness because people need to know about it to say, hey, is this what's going on? Hey, should this be checked? Um, I know someone who has similar symptoms, but it's not an easy question to answer what are lupus symptoms because it can impact so many of our, of our organ systems. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. And um, yeah, I, we have one more question. Um, and this is actually to Tiffany. Can you share information about the next lupus chat if people would like to join? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the next lupus chat will be taking place on Twitter. Um, and you can follow the lupus chat Twitter handle, which is L-U-P-U-S underscore C-H-A-T. Um, our next discussion is on December 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, our topic is talking about gift giving. And, you know, as we near the holiday season, 
uh, we want to get together and share great gift ideas to spark joy in each other's lives. Yes to joy. Yes to joy. <laughs> and gift giving, I think that that is a good tie into the to the holiday season and just the fact that being grateful for the people that we have around us, as well as the gift giving to myself, because that's the thing. I wrap a gift for myself and put it under the tree every year and open it and say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have. And um, But definitely wanted to make sure we love on our caregivers and all of those that have been supporting us all year. It's so true, Chanel, and to take time for ourselves. Um, you know, and I we all appreciate here in the room, everyone who's taken time out for this webinar, both our guests, all of our viewers, we can see how interactive you all are with the questions you've shared today. So just thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. This is not it. We're taking a little break for the holidays and then we are coming right back here on January 10th, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to be talking about more health tips, really specific to exercise, which is a big topic and how you exercise after a flare, while you have um, these symptoms. And so we'll really be getting into the nitty gritty of that. But again, we just wanna thank everyone. We want to give you a website where you can look at more information and that is biogentriolink.com. It's another great resource from all the resources we've been sharing tonight. And we really want to thank our sponsor who makes all of this great conversation possible and that's Biogen. So as we close every show with our in-house artist and uh, spoken word artist extraordinaire, Chanel, we're going to hand it over to her. <clears throat> if it wasn't for vanity in college, I don't know where I'd be. I was achy and sleepless with migraines all week. Still, I continued to keep on going. Class from 2.30 to 3, BSU meeting at 4, dance practice at 5. I have to uphold my student senate presidency. Sorority meets at 9, study from 10 to 3, 7 a.m. My day just rewinds, and that was just Monday. Party, sneaking a few conversations with every new guy I was talking to. See, this is the marsala that makes up the stew of the average college student, and I was no different in every organization. See, I was black and in charge of the Latin American Student Union. I mean, they asked. See, stress was like my best friend and I thrived in confusion, ignoring the weight that increased on my shoulders by the tons. Mornings got harder and I attributed it to me aiming to go farther than the average sophomore. Joints were swollen and sore, must be from dance practice. They say excuses are the tools of the incompetent and I was foolish to think that I could be so negligent with my body and think that all these symptoms were somehow irrelevant. It got so bad one day that I walked with a limp. So yeah, something was wrong. And I saw butterflies, not like the Mariah Carey or the Michael Jackson song, but I saw a mark on my face. Didn't matter, semester was over. I was home and back at my mom's place. Like I said, if it wasn't for vanity, I don't know where I'd be. I still, still had my symptoms, but I was glad to be home, getting ready to go out. Now, you know, I had my outfit on, went to comb my hair, and then I realized the patch wasn't there. Vanity had yet the doctor the next day said, doctor, I have some other complaints, but they can wait. Take care of this. Take care of the exterior like most people nowadays. And the doctor had this baffled look on his face. Did some blood tests, put a hat on an eye, went on my merry way. And the doctor said, Chanel, have you ever heard of lupus? And I said, no. And he proceeded to say that my immune system was too strong and attacking my own body. And much to my dismay, I had to figure out how I could fit this into my schedule. Can you believe I still went to work that day? All for vanity. I refused to see that overworking myself so as not to pay ill to others could have eventually ended my responsibilities early. Well, a few months later, my body made me rest because lupus is a disease that flares up in times of stress. And I was pushing it, fighting my humanness. Well, this machine, it broke down, but hospitalization and the possibility of death forced me to do less. 
but to put things in perspective because life is about more than just meetings and deadlines. I'm not a millionaire. I only have one life on lifeline. And if it flatlines, I don't want to have any regrets. So I vow to live every day as if I have 24 hours left. I'm an alchemist purifying myself every chance that I get. I've learned to accept experience as the past and the present as a gift. So for all the people that didn't see the sunrise this morning, you better enjoy it. Value your health and love life. And no matter where you go, know that you can make everything all right. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Please join us when we come back in January. In January, looking forward to seeing you. Have a blessed night. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.